But for tonight, you see that phrase that says dissociative identity disorder. This is going to be a mild to extreme thing again. And just to set it up, what we've been doing in this series is showing that over 90% of addicts have some mental health issues. And the most common ones are depression and anxiety. But there are parts of mental health that pretty well every addict has to deal with. And what they realize is if they don't deal with it, it keeps taking them to a relapse. And so it becomes a very important part of their recovery to get a handle on the mental health part. The second thing that we've seen is that much of the mental health issues today are being discovered that they come out of complex trauma. And so what they are is nothing more than the brain trying to find ways of coping with living in danger. Danger where you don't know how to survive for sure, and so you pick fight, flight, freeze, and you develop patterns for coping. And what the mental health piece of it is, is psychologist says, that pattern isn't normal, so we'll give it a name, and they give it a name, and it gets a mental health diagnosis. But really, it's nothing more than complex trauma coping styles. And I've tried to explain that as we go. The next thing that I've tried to make clear is that the more severe the trauma gets, the more severe response the brain needs to come up with. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. So you might have seen the phrase that says dissociative identity disorder. And if you don't know what that is, it used to be called multiple personality disorder. And you go, I don't got that, so this doesn't apply to me. But what I want you to see tonight is that all people from complex trauma develop ways of disconnecting from themselves. I was just talking with somebody this week and they said this, I spent 25 years trying not to feel, numbing out, disconnecting from all my emotions because I don't like emotions. And now I'm starting to connect. And I don't like it, but I want to do it. And I like it, what I'm seeing so far. So that is disconnection. So here's what happens. When a person's in trauma, <clears throat> the brain immediately goes to, how do I protect this child? So if they can't fight, they're too little. And they can't right, run away, they're too little. <clears throat> I will freeze. And what that starts out as, is I will disconnect. And that's the brain's attempt to try to protect you. And so you begin to disassociate with parts of reality, parts of yourself, because they're just too painful for the brain to deal with. And so to protect you, that's what it does to enable you to cope. Now, if the trauma gets even more severe, the brain will go to more severe ways of coping. And the most severe way of coping that goes with the most severe trauma is it will dissociate totally from reality. And I'll explain that in just a little bit, <clears throat> but that's what become <clears throat> Excuse me, that's what becomes known as dissociative identity disorder. <clears throat> so I want to begin with what most of you have, and that's the less severe forms of disconnection or dissociation. I find it fascinating that research is being done right now about ADHD, which is saying ADHD is a child starting to dissociate from reality. 
So they are having trouble sitting in reality and their brain is bouncing around, disconnecting, dissociating, because it's too painful in their present reality. That's ADHD. And what is being said is in, it's a form in the early stages of a child disconnecting from their reality. Most of you have that. Then we go to the next one, and most of you have done this as well where you have disconnected from certain emotions, from specific emotions. So let's say you, as a child, cry, and you got smacked for crying, and you got made fun of and called a sissy and a weakling and a baby, and so you said, I will never cry again. And you took that part of you, that emotion of crying, and you locked it away in a closet. And you said, I hate that part of me. I wish I didn't have that part of me. I'm going to do everything possible to never do that again. You disconnected, you dissociated from a part of yourself that you saw as a weakness as something that made you vulnerable to being laughed at, picked on, made fun of. And then what happened in many of you, it spread. So it might have started with crying, and then it might have happened that you were just sad one day and you got in trouble for that. And then you got angry and you got in trouble for that. And then you showed fear and you got in trouble for that. And after a while, you've taken five, six, seven emotions, and you say, I hate that about myself. I wish I wasn't that way. And you try to disconnect that part of you and lock it away. That is an early form of disconnection. And then some of you went another step and you said, I just don't like feeling, and I don't like being with my own thoughts. I don't like quietness. I don't like having nothing to do because then I get too much time to think and feel. So I'll disconnect by being constantly distracted. So I'll have one distraction after another to keep me busy, but it was just a form of disconnecting, of dissociating. And then some of you took it even further. I think you did. You went into fantasy world and you said, my family sucks, my life sucks. I like that family I see on TV. I like creating a perfect family where everybody loves everybody. Everybody's nice to everybody. And so you, when life got painful, would retreat into a fantasy world and you could act it out playing house, building forts, whatever you did, or escaping into books, escaping into TV fantasy, but you were disconnecting. And then someone further, and they said, I am not gonna feel anything. I don't wanna feel love, because when you lose somebody you love, it hurts too much. I don't wanna care about anything, because if you care about anything and it doesn't happen, then it hurts too much. I don't ever want to hope for anything, because when you hope and then you don't get it, it hurts too much. I'm shutting her all down. I'm going to become cold, lifeless. I'm going to become a stove. And that's a, a severe type of a brain disconnecting. It doesn't want to feel anything and it doesn't want to care about anything out there. And many of you have gone that. And then you found drugs and alcohol, and you said, now I have found the perfect way to remain disconnected. I never have to feel again, never have to be responsible, never have to care. I can just live in my own little escape world 
and not deal with reality and not live with myself. Now those are just the milder forms of disconnection. And I would guess that many of you here have most of those. But now I want to go to the more severe types. And these are the types that would get a psychologist to give you a diagnosis that you got big problems. But let me start with this. We're talking about severe trauma, but I want to just take a little side note. Severe trauma, we have pointed out, leads to severe shame. In other words, severe trauma, where you're abused severely, abandoned, neglected, you go, I must be a terrible person that nobody wants to be with me or that people are hurting me so badly. That I must be a terrible, defective person is severe shame. Some of the dissociation or the disconnection is not just to the pain on the outside or to the, I don't like my emotions on the inside, it is to dissociate from your shame. And that is the person who says, I like myself when really they hate themselves. It's the person who overcompensates for their shame, like we looked at last week with the narcissist and they walk around and say, I'm better than everybody, I'm a legend in my own mind. And that is that overcompensation, and we've talked about that. Now I want to go to the severe forms of disconnection from painful circumstances trauma. Number one is when a child or a person as an adult gets triggered, they become catatonic. And what that is is the deer in the headlights. They just, they're in a trance. You look at them and they're frozen and they can't move. You try to talk to them and it's like they're not there. And so the brain is in a state where they can't deal with what's happening so you freeze. And that happens and I've actually witnessed that happening in people that I know and work with when they get triggered. They go to that catatonic state. The next severe one is an out-of-body experience. And many of you, I would venture, have had that kind of thing. It would go like this. A person who is being sexually abused or severely beaten on a regular basis the brain will develop ways of surviving that. They're too little to stop it, so it will give them an out-of-body experience. So some, they can go like they're on the ceiling watching what is happening as if it's happening to somebody else. And that's their out-of-body. Others, they can just take themselves and kind of mind travel and picture themselves on the beach in the Bahamas enjoying the sun and the surf. And they're able to kind of take themselves to a different location and not even feel what is happening to them. The next thing that happens, and this is again the, the very severe, the brain will block the memory. The brain will say, you are not able to handle this. It is too painful, so I will somehow cut off your ability to even remember that it happened. And many of you have had that happen. And you have big memory blocks that part of you is wanting to know what happened and part of you is afraid to find out what happened. And so with many people will find is as they start to get healthier and as they start to get into safe relationships and safe environment they will start to get flashbacks and that is your brain's way of saying I think you're in a place now 
where we can start to deal with some of this stuff. And it can be an important part of growing. Just make sure you have somebody to support you as you go through that. Because it can be overwhelming if you're all by yourself. The next thing that can happen goes like this. We call it depersonalization. And I've listened to many of you talk about painful experiences in your past. And it's like you're reading me the encyclopedia. It is just no emotion. It's monotonous voice. This happened, this happened, this happened. Like you're describing a movie to somebody else. And so your brain has cut off, not the memory, but any emotions related to the memory. And so that is another form. Now we come to the most severe type, and we call it dissociative identity disorder. And that is when the pain is so severe, your brain has no other option but to fracture or splinter. And it's like you become two separate people or three separate people. Now, I have dealt with many people who have been diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. There's a lot of stigma around it. And if you know somebody with dissociative identity or what used to be called multiple personality, they have been made fun of and talked about as if they're totally loony, crazy, etc. But what I want you to understand is this. It comes out of a brain trying to survive and to protect a child from very, very severe trauma. And the only option available is a fracture of the personality. There's a new movie called Split. I don't know if you've seen it where a guy has 27 or something personalities. They try to make some of it humorous, etc. But it, it's Hollywood's version of trying to talk about it. And let me explain it to you, okay? When a person has so much pain, it's not like they voluntarily chose to split. It's an involuntary Thing the brain does out of desperation and that's the first thing okay you dis the person disconnects from reality around them from their emotions within them from their own thinking and their memories and their identity it is a total fracture of a person what is a very important to understand is that the brain creates what we call alter egos or alt alters and those each one of them has their own personality each one of them has a predominant mood so one could be angry one could be very sweet one could be very full of fear they all have their kind of their main mood and then they have their own history. What they are is each one plays a role in protecting the child. And it starts in childhood. So the angry one keeps the child safe. The controlling one keeps the child safe. The extremely fearful one keeps the child safe. Each one has a different role. And that's important to understand. I have counseled with people with dissociative identity and I've watched them switch right before my very eyes and all of a sudden an altar comes out and they will have a different voice and I will talk to them and they will have a, their own name, their own memories, their own history and their own vocabulary. They are a separate person. Some of them don't know the other altars. And so some of them sometimes picture it, it's like rooms in a house. 
And in each room lives a different personality, and they only come out at specific times. The main person that you see most of the time usually has certain characteristics. They're usually quite passive, very dependent on others, and very guilty feeling and usually live with depression. That's often the main person that is usually there. That person is usually seen unless they go through a certain trigger. And it could be a fear, it could be a person, but it's some stressor. And depending on the stressor, one of the altars will appear to protect them. And that is part of what happens. And so their identity switches depending on the trigger. The main person, when the trigger happens and then switch, they're not even aware of what happened. And I have been counseling with people and they switch. And I talk with the other person for a while. And then I say, can I go back and talk to the other person? And they say, okay. And I go back to the other person. And the other person isn't even aware that the switch has happened sometimes. Sometimes they are. Sometimes when they're being triggered before they switch, they will get a whole bunch of voices in their head. And they will hear a big racket. And sometimes they can't hardly hear me because there's so many people saying, don't listen to him, don't trust him, all of that kind of stuff. Now that is what usually happens. What happens with that is when the switch happens, we call it dissociative amnesia. And that means when the other person comes back, they may, four hours may have passed. And they have no memory of those four hours. They don't know where they've been, what they've done. They just know four hours is gone that they have no memory of. With the associative identity disorder, as you can imagine, it makes life very difficult for a person. Because they don't know when they'll be triggered. They don't know when they'll check out and somebody else will take over. And so it is very difficult for them to survive or live and hold down a job and all of those kind of things. As you can imagine that. Most people with it have had suicide attempts as part of that or self-harm behavior. It is a very difficult thing. So that is all of the disconnecting. But I just want to pull it together with this. Complex trauma leads to the need to disconnect. What addicts realize is that in recovery, they need to be aware of their emotions. If they start disconnecting, that's dangerous for them. Because as soon as they start disconnecting, they will start making decisions that will always end up leading to a relapse or to old behaviors that can get them a lot of, into a lot of trouble. And so, if you're wondering what's the point of talking about disconnecting, it's because every addict has spent their life trying to disconnect. And now in recovery, they realize, if I disconnect, trouble. I need to stay connected to me, to my thoughts, to my feelings, to my environment. If I don't, I can get in big trouble in a hurry. So let's go to what then do we do? So in the very more mild things that most of you have, it is so important to spend some time each day, even multiple times during a day, taking an inventory. How am I doing? Where am I at emotionally? What emotions am I feeling? 
What thoughts am I going, have going on in my mind? Are there obsessive thoughts taking place? Are negative thoughts taking over? And be aware. That is so important. And then, know the things that trigger you to disconnect. So what are the stressors that make me want to shut down? What are the things that make me not want to feel anything? Be aware of your triggers. And then learn your patterns once you are triggered. So that you can catch yourself before you get too far into your pattern. That is so important. And then... If you've taken certain emotions that you don't like in yourself and tried to lock it away and you hate that part of you because you think it makes you weak, it is going to be so important for you to learn to accept all of you. So two parts for basically everybody here. You got to accept all of you and you got to stay aware of how you're doing. Finally, to those who have some type of dissociative identity disorder, the bottom line is this. Your brain fractured you into multiple people to survive. Healing is trying to unfracture you and make you one person again. To bring all those different parts and bring them together. If you've dealt with anybody that has been in dissociative identity disorder, you know that is a very long journey. It takes a lot of time, but it is possible. I have worked, I remember the very, well, the third person I worked with who had dissociative identity disorder, and for several years, on a weekly basis, they went through one to two hours of counseling trying to reconnect all the pieces and it was such a beautiful thing to see it happen it was painful at times and what came out of that and i had the privilege of watching it was this very very beautiful person who became a great help to many people it is possible but it is a long journey and you need a lot of help. So that's all about dissociating and disconnecting and where it can lead you if you don't really work at staying connected. Let's pray.